How's everyone doing? Uh, my name's Andy, and I work at Palantir. Uh, I'm an engineer. I focus on supply chain and manufacturing. And today I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking you through how you know, we leverage generative AI in operations and how we do this to try and drive decision-making time down to zero across complex decision chains. So I think you know, what most folks in the audience likely recognize is that driving efficient and productive operations is very easy. You just have you know, 100 or so KPIs across functions, across domains, and you have to minimize some of these, maximize others. And if you do all of that perfectly, then you can go home early. Cool. So what if it's not that easy, right? And in reality, it's not. In reality, we have a complex set of systems across our ERP systems, MES systems, SCADA systems, TMS systems, WMS systems, what have you. We have data types, from structured data to unstructured data. We've got you know, images, videos, time series, geospatial, a ton of different heterogeneic data. And then, of course, let's think about the models or the business models. We have complicated ML and AI that maybe our data science teams have built for us. We also have simple models. We have VLOOKUPs in spreadsheets that maybe represent how we calculate some financial metric. And of course, the systems of action. So how do we make decisions real in the real world? How do we you know, create a purchase order, schedule a production run? These require interacting with the systems of action in the real world. And across all of this complexity, we have the tribal knowledge of our teammates, of you know, related functions, dependent functions, upstream functions. Um, and, of course, the historical decisions that we've made in our organization. So how do you take all of this complexity, bring it together, and then drive that decision time to zero um, when you're thinking about those chained decisions across the functions? And our experience has showed us over the past you know, 15 years um, that it really comes down to what we call the ontology. And I'm going to speak about that in a moment. But one thing that I just want to call out here before I do so is that that ontology is really, really the thing that's bringing together this complexity and allowing you to run chained decisions and chained simulations across this complex environment. So I use the word ontology. What is an ontology? In Palantir, what the ontology is is kind of a semantic representation that represents the data as objects that exist in your organization, the logic that links those objects, and the actions you can take with that. So as an example, let's think about a purchasing team. Maybe a purchasing team has to make a complex decision about whether to delay a purchase order or bring that purchase order in-house expedited. And that, per that decision has downstream impact. It's going to affect the cost of goods sold of the eventual finished good if we have to you know, maybe spend a little extra money to get that product in the door. That's a finance issue or a controlling issue. It's also going to affect our, our material planners and how they're running the supply chain. It's going to affect our contracting in our own department in procurement if we're you know, maybe hitting thresholds of, of you know, particular pricing. So these decisions are very complex. And the ontology is creating that concept of a purchase order. It's creating the concept of a logic source, which could be that financial logic. It could be your planning logic. It could be your production scheduling logic. And then it's creating that representation of right back into source systems so you can close the loop on decisions that you need to make in the enterprise and capture the decisions that you're making so that you have that full you know, kind of chain of thought of how a human being took a decision, what were the opportunities presented to them, the options presented to them, what decision did they take, what decision did they not take, and what sort of mathematical or business logic were they using to take that decision in the end. And all of this becomes a really, really incredible um, kind of base plate 
for running AI over the top and driving the decision time down to zero, as, as I've discussed. So what I want to do is I've spent, you know, this kind of initial introduction walking you through a theory, a theory of the ontology. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to do two things together here. Number one is I just want to show you a customer example, one organization that we work closely with and how they're leveraging these capabilities. And then I'm going to jump into an end-to-end -end demo to show you what the ontology means to different stakeholders and how, in the end, we can actually fully automate decisions across complex handoff chains between functions. So this is an example of Panasonic Energy North America. Um, we work closely with them, and they're leveraging the ontology today in the spirit that I've just described, where they're bringing together, in a maintenance context inside their factory, the historical and current maintenance data. They're bringing together team correspondence. They're bringing together equipment sensor alerts. They're bringing together you know, that common understanding of how everything has been solved in the past with respect to maintenance and the decisions that, that folks made to the extent that that data is available already. On top of this, you know, that's creating a new data asset for them as they begin to solve more and more problems in a highly structured and sophisticated way. And AI is supporting them through this process by empowering and surfacing to that end maintenance operator the summary of all of this history of information and potential solutions or recommendations of first and second approaches to take in the maintenance activity going forward. So that shop floor operator who needs to go run maintenance against one of their tickets, um, and they have you know, tens of thousands of, of tickets per month, has a hint of exactly how to get started and then provide feedback into the system so that it gets smarter and smarter over time. And this overall has led to a 10 to 15% reduction in wrench time across those tens of thousands of tickets, which is you know, an incredibly powerful story of how you're both more efficiently using the team that you have in place, but in addition to using that team more efficiently, you know, you're of course getting your machines and your factory back into operational mode quickly and you know, driving up that OEE and driving up those metrics that eventually lead to you know, customer satisfaction and, and profitability. So this is an example of you know, one organization who's using this software and a particular use case. But I often find that, at least for me, I, I learn the best by just understanding through an, a specific example. So I'm going to take you through a journey now in Palantir of a specific ontology of a notional customer. So it's a, you know, not real data, but it's spiritually similar. And I'm going to take you through such an example where we're going to look at what the ontology means to a business user, what it means to a technical user, and then how that ontology is used to solve problems, and how those solutions then beget better solutions and eventually automation. Cool. So this is a demo of kind of a front end that a business user might be looking at when they're trying to understand their network. At first, it looks a lot like a dashboard. And you'll notice here that you know, I'm bringing in data from across functions. So I have supply chain related data, operational data, finance data. So this is pulling in data from across the business. And my ontology allows me to drill up, drill down to any level of granularity that I need to understand a particular uh, KPI that I care about, a particular you know, machine to understand a particular production line, um, events that have occurred in the factory. So you can really go from this like, conceptual view of a plant in Boston all the way down to, say, you know, a specific tagged series that's coming off of a specific machine and any level of granularity in between. And this representation on the screen here, I think, starts to capture that, where you can see all of the different production lines and all of the different um, you know, machines that are in this factory. But more importantly, you can see that I can drive a maintenance request 
from this exact same front end. So that maintenance request um, you know, feeds into that maintenance concept that we were speaking about previously, but we can actually trigger a real action that writes back to the underlying ontology and to underlying systems of record. So what it allows us to do is, in a single pane of glass, you know, ask the analytical questions that we care about, but then drill down, understand what a solution might look like, and then drive the solution, maybe scheduling a maintenance event. And so what this effectively means is that in a single you know, pane of glass, you can become not just you know, smarter through the analytics, but you can become better by doing. And then, of course, you know, we can start to run you know, more complex analytics and maybe identify across all of our functions, as you can see on the screen here, the different issues that our manufacturing plant might have to produce material, products, finished goods on time and in full for our customers regardless of what function um, that, that um, you know, issue is derived from. So this is kind of that first level of understanding the ontology from uh, a user's point of view. What I want to do now is turn it over and take a look at the same concept from the perspective of maybe somebody more technical that wants to know what the building blocks are. So here we can see now a representation of what our application is. And we can also see on the left-hand side here all of the different object types that are used in that application. So we can see, for example, that you know, we have purchase orders, and we have customer orders, we have materials, and so forth. But we also have all of the actions that exist inside of that application. So these actions represent the processes that I can execute. So here, maybe this is a reallocation of material action that would both write back to an object, but would also write back to an underlying source system like an ERP if a business user said, yeah, that's a great idea. We should reallocate this material, say, from this production to the next production, and so on and so forth. And so these actions serve as building blocks just like the data inside of the ontology and can subsequently be used as kind of Lego building blocks across applications, across the enterprise. So you can see here that this particular action that I've highlighted is actually used in four applications in my enterprise. So you know we're talking about a maintenance request again. And this action can trigger a maintenance request from application A or application B or application C which I think conceptually makes sense because you have you know, different views that maybe a manager would have versus somebody on the shop floor. You have different views that you know, supply chain might have versus um, you know, somebody who's actually in quality or that you know, is part of the maintenance team. And so you can kind of give everybody the view that they need. You can also give them the logic and the actions they need as Lego building blocks. And you can build these applications incredibly quickly. And so taken together, what this ontology effectively means is that you have kind of all of the building blocks that we go through day to day when we're sitting and doing our day job, where you, know, you think, hey, I need to go get some data from the ERP, and then I need to you know, think about that data, I need to run some logic on that, I need to do some math, maybe upload to a different system, maybe go to a third system and click a green button to make something happen on the shop floor. We're exposing all of those concepts to the end user in a single framework. And so then the final piece is, well, that's really cool. So if I have an end user in here making decisions and driving maintenance or creating new purchase orders directly from the user interface, I'm also capturing information about the decisions that they're driving, um, the decisions that they're not choosing to take. And so can I then start to automate decisions or you know, give even more support to my operators through large language models, generative AI? And the short answer is yes. And I want to kind of walk you through how that can go. So what I'm looking at now is a very, very you know, specific issue in my supply chain. And what I see as an operator is a curated view that's relevant to this issue. So I can understand, hey, you know, at my manufacturing plant and my supply chain, what are my problems? What are the actions available to me? 
And then I can start to bring in generative AI to, you know, start to ask questions. Maybe something that's not presented on the screen. Maybe something that the, um, you know, developer didn't include when building this application. But I have a new question. But this large language model has access to everything I just showed you. You know, subject to governance and, and security, it has access to go and say, hey, this user wants to know about customer orders. Let's go answer their question, even though we didn't explicitly answer that on the screen. So that's super cool. So we've now accelerated this like, analytical process. At the same time, it's just chat, right? Chat is, in many ways, it's a 2023 thing. So what are we doing in 2024 to go beyond chat, to do more than just ask the data questions? And, and the answer here is that we can then take these issues and we can start to drive processes where the large language model is not just an interface for me to talk to the data, but the large language model becomes a meaningful load-bearing element in the decision-making and automation process. So what do I mean by that? We have a bunch of issues here on the left-hand side. But what we can do with our large language model is we can now ask it to run through very complex logic and give it access to all the systems of action and logic that I previously discussed. So here I'm looking at one ticket. A ticket is kind of a representation of what you saw on the previous screen. And I'm combining that ticket with other information in my ontology, like my customer orders, to understand how much do I care about this ticket? Is this ticket a problem for me or is it something to ignore? And I'm also giving it access to my logic, so my allocation function. And I'm giving it access to my actual actions so that I can you know, go in and edit a customer order through that large language model. And so taken together, if you kind of look at the three steps on the left-hand side, what we're doing there is evaluating the scope of the problem by looking at data. This is an analytical process. Then we're identifying possible solutions and running functions or complex business logic. If I have a shortage of material, can I reallocate across my plant? If I need to do maintenance, like when is the best time to run the maintenance? And so forth. And then the third and, and final piece is giving it that you know, system of action where it can directly, subject to governance, write back to that underlying source system. And you can see here, as I'm you know, kind of discussing this, um, on the screen you'll actually see AIP is going through the process of evaluating that logic in the context of all the components of my ontology to determine what course of action is appropriate for this ticket. And it's doing all of this based on kind of the you know, underlying understanding of the ontology. What's really cool, though, is you know, as I start to make decisions as an operator, because you know, maybe on day one I don't want to automate something directly you know, out of the gates, um, I can then start to say, hey, the user typically chooses you know, customer satisfaction when the cost to do so is under $1,000 you know, or more complex situations than that. Um, and then over time, that logic that I showed you on the previous screen can actually start to consider not only the data and not only the models, but also my historical decisions to drive a net new decision in a net new context. And that's what you've seen take place on the screen behind me, is we automatically resolved a bunch of different issues in the supply chain because the logic was clear what we needed to do given our business context and our business setting and our business priorities. But you'll also notice that right there in the middle of the screen, we actually couldn't solve one of the issues. So we have this surgical mask shortage where we actually do need a person, maybe a business expert, to step in and make a final decision about how to solve this surgical mask shortage. But we're not just saying, hey, user, go solve the problem. We're saying, here, let me serve to you on a silver platter all the contextual information you need to make the best decision. Because I've already gone and done all the math and found all the relevant data in order to make a good decision. And I just am not sure what you would want to do, user. And so now I can go in and execute a decision. I've enriched 
my underlying data asset. And as time continues, more and more of these decisions we can automate through a process like the one that you've seen here. And this it automates all the way back to that underlying system of record um, as, you know, we, as we feel more and more confident about certain decision paths and that governance around how to actually go from assisted decision to automated decision um, is built directly into the platform um, to help along that journey. So I recognize that I blasted through a ton of content in about 20 minutes. Uh, admittedly, I normally spend about 60 minutes on a similar presentation. So I hope that it's kind of piqued your curiosity and your interest. And what we'd be really, really excited to do would be to talk further about this. So we're sitting actually just straight over here, um, kind of towards the other side of, of the um, AWS footprint. And we'd be happy to chat further today, tomorrow, later in the week. And of course, if this is a, you know, compelling content and you're thinking, hey, that's pretty cool, could we spend one day together on my real data and just get started? Um, yeah, absolutely. The answer is yes. We could just book a boot camp together and get started on your data and show you kind of the art of the possible over the course of one, two days. Um, so a lot of different ways to engage further, whether you want to meet us at our booth or you know, scan the QR code and, and meet up with us later at a boot camp, dealer's choice. Um, but I certainly appreciate everybody's uh, attention and look forward to the follow-on conversations. Thank you.